Welcome to Free Christian Church of God's video outreach ministry, bringing the gospel message of Jesus Christ into your home each and every Sunday morning. If you would like more information about the video ministry or other ministries that we have to offer, stay tuned immediately following this program. And now, open your Bibles and follow along as we bring you today's message. Oh, isn't it nice to have electricity? You know, I don't mind electricity. I don't mind missing electricity. I, I can do without the lights. I can probably do without TV and do without the internet. But I can tell you one thing. I cannot do without the air conditioning. <laughs> Not when it's 108 degrees outside. It isn't like you can open the window and cool off. I mean, you, you can only give up so much. I have learned this past week that I have absolutely, ne- there will never, ever be any opportunity for me to become Amish. <laughs> I, I, I will not do it. I will not do it. But we're spoiled. We talk about suffering. Oh, we suffered this week. You know, we, we didn't suffer this week. We were inconvenienced. There are people who live in countries around this world who have temperatures like that all of the time. On top of it, they don't have any food to eat. They're watching their children die. People are, are, are sick in the streets. We were just inconvenienced. But we had a little taste of what it's like. That ought to make us stand up and work for the kingdom of God. To reach people, to help people. We need to feed people. People that are hungry can't hear the gospel over the sound of their stomach. And we need to feed people. And we need to take care of people who are sick. And we need to do that job so we can do our job of spreading the gospel around the world. And, uh, and I certainly think that you could help do that. You could help do that. You know, we missed a week's worth of church, and we, we, you know, we missed an offering around the church. Hopefully you all recognize that. It wasn't a freebie, you know. Uh, you know oh, good, we got an extra week, you know. Uh, and, and you should have a lot left over because your electric bill isn't going to be near what it was <laughs> last month. And so, and so God's going to give you some opportunities to help out. I want you to get some of those storm registrations ready in the back, if you would. Okay, take your Bible this morning and turn to Colossians chapter 3. Now, I didn't get to preach to you for two weeks. I had the sermon ready two weeks ago. Ronnie came in the office today. She said, do you have a title for your sermon? I said, 4th of July message. But I'm more than willing to make up for lost time. So I have a series, part one and part two. And for your convenience, I'm going to give you both parts today. Colossians chapter 3, when you get there, stand your feet. Y'all didn't think that was funny, did you? I wasn't joking. All right, Colossians chapter 3. Lift your Bible in the air. Say it along with me. This is my Bible. It's God's infallible word. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of God. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the word of God. My mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts toward God. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your husbands as fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at all of it with all of your heart as working for the Lord and not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. Father, we pray today for your anointing to be on your word. God, this is a message to us as a people, message to us as a household and as a family. God, it's a message to fathers and mothers and to children. God, there isn't a person here who can say this isn't for me. And God, I pray you'll deliver it to our hearts. God, that we might walk out of here different people than what we came in. 
Oh, we go to church every week, and we think we're pretty good, and we have it together. But, God, we are not yet there. We are not like Christ. There are things about us that need to change, things that need to be different. And, God, I pray today you'll continue that work in our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Everything that we do, ultimately, we're doing it for the glory of God, the Father. Whether it's studying for a test or working on a job or playing an instrument or fixing the church roof. Everything we do is for God's glory. Now that means that if you would do a bad job in anything, you're ultimately insulting God and not fulfilling the purpose for which he made you. God didn't make you for you, he made you for him. And he made you to bring him pleasure, to bring him glory, and to bring him honor. Now we do a lot of things. But there's one thing in particular that we do that I want to focus on today, and that is the family. There have been many subtle changes in the family over the last several years. Gradual changes that we really didn't notice when they were taking place. But when we look back, we can now are able to see how far removed we are from the families that we used to be. There have been many times in my life when I wish I could turn back the clock and take my family with me so my children and my grandchildren could experience the innocence of the world that I was privileged to grow up in. You remember that world? It was a world where you didn't have to lock your doors at night or take the keys out of your car. It was a world where you could let your children walk uptown by themselves and know that they would be okay. It was a world where the worst offenses in school were chewing gum and talking in class. It was a world where you didn't have to monitor your TV or worry about the Internet. I'll have to be honest with you, I miss those days. I miss those days. I told you a few weeks ago, if I ever lose my mind, you will find me on the front porch with Andy and Opie and Barney getting ready to go down to Goober's and get a pop. I mean, that's where I'll be. The sad fact of the matter is those days are gone and they're not coming back. When innocence is lost, it can never be retrieved. But how did we get to where we are today? What happened that caused us to lose our innocence and opt for this world that we're living in? It all began in the home. As we bought into the lies of the enemy and we slowly walked away from our God-given responsibilities as husbands and wives, as fathers and mothers and as children. We've abandoned our responsibilities as parents. We've abdicated the office of parent. The role of parent is an office that is established by God. That's why when God said, honor your father and your mother, he didn't qualify those words by saying honor them only if they're honorable. But he warned us to honor them for the office that they hold. Honor them whether they're a good parent or a bad parent. Honor them whether they deserve it or not. Honor them no matter what kind of job they did. Because by honoring your parent, you're not honoring the person so much as you are honoring the, the office, the position that God has established for order in the home and order in his creation. It's in that order that we find God's blessing. And it's without that order that we are cursed. The trouble is many parents have abdicated the office of parent. They found that it's much easier to give away the responsibilities to some other person or to another organization and to have, than to have to deal with those responsibilities themselves. They've given away the responsibility of being a godly parent to a big brother government or to schools or to teachers or to coaches. They've given it away to law enforcement and judges. And the home and the family suffers because no one is serving in the office of parent. We've abdicated our roles because we've neglected our responsibilities as parents. We've abdicated the role of educator. Parents used to educate their children. The church used to be the schoolhouse and the Bible was the textbook, but now our government educates our children. Federal tax programs build our school buildings and politically correct panels write our textbooks based upon a deprived view of God's creation. We've abdicated the role of disciplinarian. Parents no longer correct their children because they're convinced that it's against the law to correct their children. They fear that somebody will turn them into the authorities if they discipline their child. Now you've been there. You've been in the grocery store or you've been at the mall and you've seen a parent with a child and that child is acting up. 
They're out of control. You look at the parent, and the parent has this hopeless look on their face. Like, what can I do? And you know as well as I do, you're standing over there in the next aisle going, let him have it. Skin him alive. I won't tell anybody. So they don't discipline their child. And now they're raising a monster who lacks in fundamental social skills. A child who refuses to listen to any authority because the only authority he's ever knew he's never had to listen to. He can't get along with the other children and he will not grow out of it. That's a misnomer. The child left to himself will bring his mother to shame, Proverbs 29, 15, and he will someday become a dysfunctional adult. Some have abdicated the role of disciplinarian and they've replaced it with psychology. Instead of correcting their child, they're trying to understand their child. And what was once considered meanness or rebellion is now labeled as an emotional disorder. My dad had a cure for emotional disorder. (laughs) As a matter of fact, my dad operated a clinic for emotional disorder out back, nicknamed the Woodshed, where in just one or two sessions, he could cure anybody. (laughs) We've abdicated the role of moralist. And we allow television and radio and Hollywood and the music industry to teach our children what's right and what's wrong. So today it's okay to take God's name in vain. But it's wrong to speak out against homosexuality. It's all right to have sex out of marriage, but it's wrong to pray in the schoolhouse. It's all right to spend your hard-earned money on lottery tickets, but it's ludicrous to give to God 10% of your income. We've abdicated the role of minister, and we no longer lead our families to the house of God. Instead, we lead them to other places. We lead them to the gymnasium. We lead them to the ball field. We lead them to the campground. But we fail to lead them into the house of the Lord. And now because we've abdicated our roles, we've lost the authority that came with those roles. And our homes are a mess. Our society is a mess because we have broken God's order. We've renounced the kingdom of family. We've renounced the royal order that was established by God's divine hand. It was God that structured the family. It's God that put man as the head of the household. It's God that put made the woman his helpmate. It's God that put the children under the parents. But we have inverted and diverted and distorted that structure. We've renounced the kingdom of family, and now we have dysfunction. In God's structure for the home, dad is the patriarch. It used to be... The dad was the king of his castle. Today, many dads are just the court jester. But it used to be that what dad said is what went. Now, we all knew that the king and the queen talked behind closed doors. But out in public, it was the king that laid down the law. It didn't have to be right. You didn't have to agree. But you dared not disagree out loud. It wasn't a democracy. Nothing was ever put up for a vote. There was no time for rebuttal. How many of you remember what I'm talking about? But there was order and there was decency and there was structure. There was no room for rebellion or discord, dysfunction or disharmony because everybody understood the order of the kingdom. Nobody ran off to their room because there was no such room as the house as your room. Nobody got to do their own thing or had their own stuff because everybody understood that everything in the castle belonged to the king. But the king knew that he answered to a higher power. Dad understood that his head was God. And God was going to hold him accountable for how he ran his little kingdom. In God's structure for the home, mom is the matriarch. It used to be the mom was the queen of the castle. And if anybody in the castle didn't treat the queen with respect and with dignity and with honor and humility, they had to answer to the king. But it's not so in the home today. But today, queens have descended from their throne to pursue other things. They're no longer concerned about the kingdom, but they're more interested in trivial matters. 
They're no longer concerned about teaching their little princes and princesses how to be royalty because they're too busy outside of the castle to spend the time. In some homes, the queen is abused by her children because the king no longer acts as her covering. Her children can speak back to her and disobey her and in some cases even abuse her because the king is no longer doing his job. We're in trouble if we don't fix it. The kingdom is going to fall. We've also abandoned the supper table. Now this may not sound important to you, but just listen to me. We are driven to possess material things. We want bigger and we want better. We want more and no matter how much we have, we are never satisfied. We have never enough money and we never have enough time. And because we are so driven to gain earthly treasure, we have sacrificed our home life. It's now breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But we've lost a great meal from our agenda. That meal was called supper. How many of you remember years ago when people used to eat supper? Supper was the time when mom would show off her cooking skills because she knew that everybody in her castle was going to be there to appreciate it. Mom enjoyed making supper. Now, that didn't mean it wasn't work. It was hard work making supper. It was in days before air conditioning and gourmet kitchens. It was before microwaves and instants. But mom took pride in making supper for her family. She peeled the potatoes, and she boiled the potatoes, and she mashed the potatoes. I get to think, she spent more time on the potatoes alone than most of us spent on the entire meal today. She would make that old-fashioned giblet gravy because we didn't worry about our cholesterol. She would cook the corn and bake the beans and roast the meat and set it all out on the supper table and wait for dad to come home from work and the kids to come home from school and they would all come into the dining room and sit at their own place. You always knew if somebody was missing because there was a place that was vacant at the table. But today we've abandoned the supper table. We no longer sit around the table at night and talk about how our day is gone. We no longer vent our problems or share in our victories. We have lost a valuable line of communication in our families because we no longer have time for supper. We replace the supper table with fast food. Not healthy food or good food, but food that will fill you up if you can keep it down. We now depend on Pizza Hut or Ronald McDonald or Colonel Sanders to cook for us. We hit the drive through on the way home from work or we fly into the house and we grab the telephone and we place our order for junk food. And because we have abandoned the supper table for junk food, we've created junk families with no energy and no stamina and no joy. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 21, it says, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. In the 1980s and 1990s, news reports of personal community violence became almost routine in our news. It was common to hear about a local post office or a factory where some disgruntled employee came in and and, and shot his co-workers. Or to hear about a distraught uh, lover who killed his estranged girlfriend and then ended up ending his own life. We heard about gang members killing other gang members in drug-related incidents. We heard about mystery serial killers baffling law enforcement and still on the loose. But we heard such stories so frequently that we became numb to the atrociousness of the crimes. It was just the nightly news. But then on March 24th in 1998 in Jonesboro, Arkansas, two young boys, Mitchell Johnson, age 13, and Andrew Golden, age 11, shot at their classmates and their teachers from the woods killing four students and one teacher and wounding ten other people as their West Side Middle School emptied during a false fire alarm. We were briefly awakened from our coma, but we comforted ourselves believing that it was just an isolated incident. It was a, it was a freak occurrence that, that would never ever happen again. But then about a year later on April the 20th, 1999, at the Columbine High School, it happened again. And 12 students and one teacher were killed by their classmates. We were shocked to the core. The murders at Jonesboro and Columbine and then in other schools across our country didn't fit the normal pattern for teen murder and suicide. It seemed to be motivated by something that was much deeper and much more sinister. Just as ironic was where these things took place. It wasn't in the ghetto. 
It wasn't in the high crime district. It wasn't in the drug infested immoral zones of Bourbon Street. But it happened in the pleasant suburbs of the most technologically advanced, economically powerful, and culturally influential communities of the most powerful nation in the world. And it was epidemic. The 20th century began with great promise. The industrialized West anticipated an age of unbounded progress. Science was poised to conquer nature once and for all, to bring disease and hunger and poverty to an end. But just as the unsinkable Titanic failed to live up to its own billing, so also the dreams of the 20th century were no match for the violent capacity of human nature. In the last 100 years, nearly 175 million lives have been deliberately extinguished by politically motivated carnage. The murder rate in the United States was 10 times higher at the end of the century than it was at the beginning of the century. The rate of suicide and violent crimes by our teenagers has tripled in the last 25 years. A quarter of a million households are now victimized by crime every year. All forms of child abuse are on the rise, physical and sexual and emotional. But what we're experiencing doesn't fit our perception of mankind because we have been duped into believing that man is evolving for the better. As proponents of evolution that teaches that man is evolving and improving with time, how could this be? We're, more, we're convinced that we're more intelligent than we've ever been. We're more educated and more adept uh, than ever before. We have more technology in our hands than the world has ever seen. We're confident that we've evolved to the top of the evolutionary ladder. So how could this happen to us? And the answer rings out. It must be a faulty generation. It's an era of bad seed, a, a genealogical flaw. Well, I'm here to tell you that we do have a faulty generation. We do have troubled teenagers. We do have a society of young people who are bent on their own destruction. But church children are not born that way. They are trained that way. In Genesis 2, God created man and he created woman. And in Genesis chapter 4, God created the family. It's this structure that is foundational to society. Yet in 1998, one in every three births in this country was outside of the bonds of marriage. It's no wonder because in recent years, sex has become more important than marriage. And marriage is barely important at all. Many people marry and divorce while most others just cohabitate without the thought of marriage, in spite of what God says. You see, the problem today isn't societal flaws. Our problem isn't with immorality. Our trouble isn't with peer pressure and antagonism. Our problem isn't that we have too many guns and too much violence on TV. Our troubles aren't happening because we don't have enough laws on the books. We don't need a billion more dollars to spend on education and government programs, but God says that it all begins with the family, and the family begins with fathers. In our nation, 70% of young people held in state reform institutions. 70% are from one parent or no parent homes. The FBI's National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime says three most frequent factors in the history of a murderer are failure in emotional attachment to their mother, a failure to use their parents as role models, and physical or sexual abuse in the home, which is six times higher in a family where a divorced mother has remarried. It's 14 times higher for children living alone with their biological mother. It's 20 times higher for children living alone with their biological father. 20 times higher for children living with cohabitating but unmarried biological parents. And 33 times higher for children living with a biological mother who is living with a man who isn't their father. Trends for the future are not good. Criminologists predict a wave of super criminals who raise you without positive male role models to give them the proper guidance or affection. That's why before he addresses anything else, God says, fathers. Almighty God, by his divine declaration, has placed the responsibility for the family squarely upon the shoulders of the man of the house. 
In 1 Corinthians 11, 3, God said, But I would have you know that the head of every man, every man, is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. God said, gentlemen, I have put you in charge. Now, you are not the dictator. Some men believe that they are the dictator, and their wife is their slave. After all, God gave her to him as his helpmate. But gentlemen, she is not just there to help you work, but she's also there to help you think and to help you make decisions because God knew before he ever made Adam that two heads are better than one. You're not the dictator, but you are responsible for your house. God said, just like I'm responsible for you. And you're going to answer to me when all is said and done. You're accountable for your marriage, you are liable for your children, and you are responsible for your home. Oh, but how many fathers shirk their God-given responsibility? A man who would sleep with their child's mother and then run is not a man. A man who refuses to care for his family and he leaves an unwed mother to make ends meet with a monthly welfare check is not a man. A man who would neglect the needs of his family to pour alcohol down his throat or shoot drugs up his arm is not a man. A man who doesn't have time for the children he's brought into the world because he's spending so much time on himself is not a man. Gentlemen, God has called you out. I could fix the welfare problem in this country. Because every child has a biological father. And if we staked daddy to the ground and made daddy pay the bill, welfare would go away. Well, but preacher, what about the mother? Doesn't she have equal responsibility or even more so maybe for the mother, especially when the kids are young? Well, God gave his only son first to a mother. And God knew what he was doing. And I got news for you. God hasn't changed his mind. He hasn't changed his mind. Oh, but don't you think that God's in favor of liberating women? In God's eyes, being a wife and being a mother never made a woman captive in the first place. What we're talking about here is the order of responsibility. Some men are not the head of their household because they just don't want to be. They don't want to be. Like little boys, they run from their responsibilities by making excuses. Men, you're good at making excuses. You know, if around the church it weren't for the women working, there wouldn't be a church. And the thing is, the men ought to be doing the work. Every Sunday night, we are addressing the men separately and addressing the ladies separately. And I encourage you to be here tonight because you need to hear what we're talking about. We're going to teach you what God tells you it ought to be. But men shirk their responsibility. They make excuses. They say, it's not my thing. I'm just not good at it. She'd do a better job without me. So the wife pays the bills, and she cares for the physical and emotional needs of the kids. She cleans the house and cooks the meals and tends to the wounds and buys the groceries and balances the checkbook. But God said, fathers. However, some men don't wear the pants in their family because they can't get them from their wife. Some women complain about their husband, but they refuse to submit to their husband as the head of their household. There are women who run their homes and run their kids and run their husbands and they still can't figure out why their home life is dysfunctional and doesn't work. Come to me for counseling. I'll explain it to you. Ladies, God has given you an honorable role in the life of your family, but hear me today. Your husband is going to be the one held accountable to God. He's the one that's going to stand before the judgment seat. He's the one that's going to have to come up with the answers as he stands before the Lord. So please, give him back his pants. He says, fathers, provoke not. We've learned selfishness and self-centeredness. We've taught our children growing up that life is a me thing. Care for my needs, supply for my wants, fulfill my desires. The idea of sacrifice sounds ludicrous to most people. The thought of giving up something that we want for somebody else is out of the question. Because if we did that, it would take away from our pleasure. It would interfere with our rights. It would distract from our plans. So we teach our children selfishness and self-centeredness. But you know, that doesn't translate well into adulthood. You take a teenage boy who's been trained in selfishness by the example of his parents all of his life, and suddenly make him a husband and a father, and you have a mess. You take a boy who has never had to work for anything or show any responsibility and strap a family to his back, and you have a mess. 
You take a young buck who's never had to care about anybody but himself and give him a wife and a child and you have a mess. Our children can no longer be involved in the school or no, uh, no longer be involved in the church or social activities because we are too busy to drop them off and pick them up. Our schedule doesn't permit us to watch their games or attend their recitals so they don't get to participate. Or we're so wrapped up in secular things that we neglect their spiritual life and drop out of church. You saw the video. We have a storm youth conference coming up the week after Bible school. It's for all of northwest Ohio. We want to have 400 teenagers here. And you can cut this if you need to later. We have 80 kids in our church youth group. There should be 80 kids registered from this church, and there isn't. And mom and dad, you haven't even checked on it. You haven't even checked on to see whether they are registered or not registered. We can't wait till the last minute. It's costing thousands of dollars. We need to know who's coming. And your teenager needs to be here. You complain that you don't have stuff for teenagers. You don't, oh, there aren't enough things going on. There aren't things for my kids to go to. Well, we have one now. And out in the, in the narthex, on your way out of church today, there's going to be a table and there's going to be registration forms. And mom and dad, I want you to sign up your teenager. You pay your, what, $25? $20. You pay their $20. And you stop complaining about your kids till you do something about it. There needs to be 80 kids from this church registered. Register your neighbor's kid. Register the kid that, that your kid runs around with and get them here. Teenagers, if you haven't signed up, shame on you. Shame on you. This is your church. This is your responsibility. This is your community. You need to sign yourself up and you need to sign your friends up. And you need to get it done now. Our children have all of this energy. And they have all this creativity, but they're stifled and they're not permitted to use it. So like a racehorse, they're at the starting gate. They're filled with unleashed energy and unused potential. And we wonder why they find trouble. Fathers provoke not. We fill our refrigerators with alcohol and our closets with dope, and then we tell our kids to leave it alone. Fathers provoke not. We bring pornography into our house through the TV set and online through the computer, placing into our child's mind a perverted idea of sex and relationships, and then we expect them to stay out of mischief. Fathers provoke not. We teach them how to curse and how to swear and how to defy authority as we brag about what we don't do at work and what we get away with. And then we demand that they perform well in school and do their chores around the house. Fathers provoke not. We treat their mothers like dirt, abusing them physically and emotionally. We teach our young men that women are sex objects and playthings, only there to do what we want when we want, but dare our offspring follow in our footsteps. God said, fathers provoke not. Provoke not your children. God isn't interested in what kind of mark you leave on this world. He isn't concerned with your rank in society. He doesn't care about your business expertise, your financial independence, or your position on Wall Street. It doesn't matter to God if you're in who's who or who's not. But he's holding you personally accountable for the influence that you have impacted on your own children. Provoke not your children to anger. So I heard a lady on the radio one day. She said, when I was growing up, she said, and in school, she said, I was fat, I had glasses, and I had bad hair. She said, I was teased mercilessly every day. Every day I would go home from school, and I'd be crying. And she said, my mom would say to me, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. She said, the difference in my life, I am here today because I had somebody there when I got home. How many children are suffering today simply because they don't have anyone at home when they get there? We've been so preoccupied with ourselves that we've neglected the most basic and fundamental needs of our children. We've replaced the lost art of listening with earphones and CD players. We've replaced the supper table with drive through and the carry-out. We replace the shelter of nurture and love with an empty house and people with video games and TiVos. Our children have no one to tell their troubles to. They have no one to share in their dreams. They have no one to run to when they're afraid or to cry on when their heart is broken. And in this frustration that we as fathers have created, they have become angry. There was a boy named Derek. Derek was handicapped. Because of his handicap, he was frustrated 
and he was angry. But he wanted to be like the other boys, and he went out for the basketball team, just like the rest of the kids. One day at basketball practice, he became so frustrated, he threw a fit, threw a ball at one of his teammates, and he ran off of the floor into the locker room. Everybody said he has a bad attitude. You just need to let him go. We don't need guys like that on the team. In a first experience, that's exactly what anyone would want to do. But God wouldn't let me get him out of my mind. The Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, Chase him, find him, talk to him. I found him in the locker room tearing up the lockers. And I grabbed a hold of him. And I'm sure that he was expecting some kind of violence from me. But I looked him dead in the eye and I said, Derek, do you want to be on this team? And he began to cry. And he said, yeah. I said, then you're going to go back out there. You're going to apologize to your teammates. And we're going to have practice. I never had a problem with Derek again. We've provoked our children by the things that we've not done. We've taunted them by not being there. We've teased them with our own sins and set them up for a great fall. And they're angry. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger. What would cause a young teenager to welcome death? Why do some want to live fast and die young? Why do they still fill themselves with alcohol and drugs that they know will destroy their body and take their life? Why do they challenge death, daring to do the extreme? Why do many of our teenagers not perceive a life after 40? The reason's all too simple. They viewed this world through the life of their fathers, and they see no hope for the future. They see no life because they've witnessed their dads, and they've condemned themselves. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Are you an encouragement or a discouragement to your children? When you speak to them, is it always in negatives, criticizing what they're doing wrong and pointing out the things that they haven't done? Or do you recognize the vulnerability of their age? Do you remember what it was like when you were their age, when you have no confidence in yourself and you don't know who you are and you're not sure where you're going and you're burdened by the pressure of your peers? Do you build them up by bragging on them on the things they do well and let them know that it doesn't matter what anybody else says. They can become whoever they want to be. Have you set the bar so high they can never attain it? Or have you set no bar at all because you really don't care? The Bible says that children are a gift from God. They are a treasure, a prized possession, and an awesome responsibility. The solution to our problem is a simple one. The book of James tells us that the true reflection of a man or a woman can be found by looking into the mirror of God's Word. If you really want to know how you're doing, then look in the book. If you want to know how to do it right, look into the book. If you want to fix your home and fix your marriage and fix your family, then you have to look into the Word of God. Gentlemen, the most manly, macho man that ever walked the face of the earth was Jesus Christ. He never once got drunk with the gang smoked a cigar, shot veins in his dope, or beat up a female. Yet he was an example of everything that a real man is. He wasn't afraid to cry. He wasn't afraid to pray. He wasn't afraid to help his neighbor or to go to church. But when he went to the cross without saying one word in his own defense, to pay the price for something that he didn't do. If you want to be a real man, then have the guts to walk where Jesus walked. Pick up your cross and follow in his footsteps. If you want to be a real woman, an attractive woman, a complete woman, then become a godly woman. Stop trying to do it your way and stop trying to do it the world's way and do it God's way. Everything that we do is to glorify God. So the question of the day is, is God being glorified by your life? Is he being glorified by your home? Is he being glorified by your family? If not, then you have some very serious work to do. Father, I pray today that we will answer the call that is on our heart. Father, you're speaking to us right now. God, we know where we are. God, we know what kind of job we have been doing. And God, we know what kind of a mess we have. Father, might we respond to the Holy Spirit today. God, answer the call 
to step up to the plate and become the men and the women and the children of God that we are supposed to be in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching today's message from Free Christian Church of God in Continental Ohio. To find out more information about Free Christian Church of God or to receive a copy of Rev. James Fry's weekly television program, Your Life, call the church office at area code 419-596-3103 or visit our website at freecog.org and download your copy today.